us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, God. Lord, we love you so much tonight. We thank you for the body of Christ and the many facets of the body of Christ. And we thank you that you've called us together by your name to this place tonight. We just pray now that the Holy Spirit would teach us from your word. Your word is truth. Your word is healing. Your word is liberty. God, I just pray, Lord, that you would just set us all free. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, we're in the book of Matthew. Amen. We arrived in the New Testament. Praise Amen. God. Amen. You know, uh, there are a group of people around that will say that the Old Testament is not necessary anymore because, after all, we have the New Testament. We have the New Covenant. But let me tell you something. The Old Testament really is the autobiography of God. It tells you who God is. It tells you his how he created the universe. It also tells you about his character, his sovereignty, his power, his rule, what he loves, what he hates, his jealous nature because he's God. We also see his grace and compassion in the Old Testament. He tells us who he is. It also tells us how we messed it up at the very beginning. And from the very get-go, God has a purpose and a plan to bring us back to him in that intimate relationship that we had in the very beginning before sin entered the world. And we, we look at Matthew, and Matthew is a book that was written to the Jews. There were 400 years of silence before the, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the New Testament says, in the fullness of time, God sent his son. The Kairos moment, God knows what he's doing. He has his own timetable. He knew when it was time to call our beloved brother home. God rules and reigns in the fullness of time. You take a look at you take a look at the world at that time. You can almost see, yeah, God, that's right. It's a good time because of the fact that Asia and Europe and Africa were all under together under the rule of the Roman Empire. They had a strong Greek. Uh, what can I say, heritage with a Greek language that everybody understood. Romans built roads so people could travel everywhere. And it was a Pax Romanus, there was a peace of Rome. So it was a perfect setting for that time for God to say, it's time, son, you're going down there to accomplish the purpose for which I want to send you. And when he came in the fullness of time, is mentioned in the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now the Gospels were written to different groups of people at different times. Matthew, like I said, is directed to the Jews. In the very beginning of Matthew, in the very first chapter, very first verse, it talks about Jesus Christ coming from being the son of David, as well as the son of Abraham. Now why is that important? Because we know when we take a look at this overall plan that God had, he came to Abraham and he gave him some promises. And he told him, you're going to have children, you're going to have land, and through your seed, the entire world is going to be blessed. And we followed that promise through the line of Abraham. And we promise it, we see it again and again and again. In the fullness of time, that promise was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Because he is the son of, Ab of Abraham, and he is the one who is going to bring and has brought peace to the world and the answer, the solution to our problem in regards to sin. He's son of David. Because God had come to David and said, David, you are going to have someone on your throne with a kingdom that will never end. And Jesus Christ comes from the line of David. It wasn't by accident when there, the kingdom was, uh, Israel was divided and you had the northern and you had the southern kingdom. You had Israel up here and you had Judah down here. Oh, it, it wasn't by coincidence that up, up in the northern part, they had all kinds of dynasties. All kinds of families rule. It was like King of the Mountain. They're pushing over each other and they're ruling. But in the south, in the kingdom of Judah, where Jesus came from the line of Judah. David came from the line of Judah. That in, two, in that entire time, listen carefully, there was only one family ruling. 
They had a lot of different kings, but they all came from one family. Whose family? Well, the line of David. Why? Because God keeps his promises. This is what's exciting. People who criticize the Bible don't take time to read and study it. A book that's written by different authors over all these years and comes together, and you can see the red thread of redemption all the way through. Well, now we're on this side of the cross, and we can um, study the book of Matthew. So let's take a look at Matthew. I was given Matthew 11, 12, and 13. Oh, my goodness. Everyone, if we took time to hit everyone, we would probably just get a little coding and not really get something to hold on to. So I am going to take just a little part of it because I know God's way of doing things. It'll come, something that's missing that I'm passed over here will come up when we study Luke or when we study John. So I want you to focus in now on chapter 12. And we're just going to listen to the first 14 verses. And let's hear, and then I'll give you some background and teach you some lessons from it. Chapter 12. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now when he had departed from there, he went into the synagogue. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, that they might accuse him? Then he said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. Let's stop there. You know, in any good book, those of you who have had anything to do with literature or English, you know you always have a protagonist, a good guy. Those of you who are into movies, you know there's always the good guy. And he has to, he's going to accomplish a purpose, and he always has opposition. We call that the antagonist, the ones that come against him. Well, when Jesus Christ was born, and he grew up, he had opposition. He was born here, he didn't come full grown, he came here as a baby to fulfill every dot, jot and tittle of the law. And as he grew up, and as he became a man and began his ministry, he had opposition. And the opposition sometimes came from who? Places you didn't think you would have. Did you know that he had opposition from his own family? His own family was against him. Do you know he had opposition too at times from his disciples who tried to protect him from carrying out his assignment to go the distance and be, and be crucified for, for, for um, the, the remission of our sins? He had opposition from the family. He had opposition from the, he had opposition from the crowds. Remember they wanted to crown him king and make him king so that he could overthrow the Roman government. Opposition. But the number one opposition, aside from the evil one, who was using all of them against him, were the Pharisees and the scribes. These are the same mentality, the same group that went after Paul and got him all riled up and he always had to defend the truth against them. The same ones that stoned P, uh, Stephen, the Pharisees. The Pharisees, the legalists. You know, the Pharisees started off great. During that time period between the Old and the New Testament, the Jewish people were being threatened by the Greek culture, much like the Church of Jesus Christ is being threatened by the modern-day culture. The culture wants to take over and change the church. 
And there was a group of people, a group of Jews that said, look, we're going to hold on to what God has said. This is truth. And they were the Pharisees. Because the priests were, most of them were just as corrupt as the rest of them. And they made sure that the, the word of God was preserved. And they made sure the law was kept. And they actually saved the people through a very difficult time. But like many, 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 many sects, many things that happen as time goes by, they started to change. In other words, they not only took the law, but then they decided to add their own traditions and their own ways of carrying out that law. To honor the Sabbath day, to keep it holy, they might add their little things. You can only walk so many steps, and you can only pick up this and that. They had all kinds of crazy laws. And they were proud of these laws, and people looked up to them because they prayed on the street corners, and they wore their gowns. You, know, you, you see them in our movies that we have. These are the number one people against Jesus. And here we see them introduced, right here in chapter 12. Jesus and the boys are going through, and all they do is pluck off some grain. They're hungry. And here comes the Pharisees. Don't you know? They're breaking the Sabbath. They ain't supposed to do that. And Jesus said, you know, he uses two good Old Testament situations. He said, don't you remember when, when uh, David was running away from Saul and he stopped at Nob and he stopped the tabernacle and he, and he was hungry and they gave him some of the show bread now, the showbread were 12 loaves of bread in the tabernacle Thank you. that uh, was represented the 12 tribes of Israel. It represented the communion that they had with God. You know, when you break bread together, it's a, a sign of communion. It was a sign also of a reminder of God's provision to these people. Well, David was hungry. He didn't go in there and eat, have some of the bread because he wanted to violate the Sabbath. He went in there because he had a feed. He was hungry. He needed food. And that's what he did. So the Lord said, you know, it was just out of necessity. He didn't attempt to do it. And by the way, what about your priests? Do you realize they had to do double duty on the Sabbath as opposed to during the week and they worked extra hard? And do you realize they worked extra hard on the Sabbath and you never did call them under the carpet because they were doing more work than they are supposed to be doing? And so he talked to them about this. You see, he saw their hearts, and their hearts were hard. Their righteousness was based on obeying every law that they wrote. And they themselves saw in Jesus somebody who was rebelling against their laws. <coughs> Jesus made a comment. He said, Someone greater than the tabernacle, where is it? He says, one greater than the temple is here. You know, it was Paul who said what? The fullness of Godhead dwells bodily in Jesus Christ. He was the temple, the embodiment of God himself. And that's exactly what he's referring to. And of course, that really upset them because they pride themselves in their lovely temple. But then he says to them, he says, you know, if you would just listen to what it says in, in um, Hosea 6.6, 6, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You know, God says this, I don't want your offerings. I want you to know me. He wants the heart. He doesn't want all these out external commitments. And of course, Jesus saw that about these people and he realized that they had no heart other than a stony heart and they protected their own quote pursuit of righteousness by being obedient at least they thought they were as obedient as they could be and then the challenge in the temple oh my goodness you know Jesus could see and read the minds of these people can you imagine here's a man who's got a withered hand probably out begging because he only has one hand if he gets his other hand restored, he can go out and work. And here he is, he on the Sabbath again, and here are the Pharisees checking out Jesus to see what he's going to do. And the minute he heals that man, do you think those people would go, oh, and they repent 
and, and have compassion on, are you kidding? No way. In fact, the fact that Jesus broke what they thought was against their law, because after all, they didn't see anything wrong with rescuing their animals on the Sabbath, and the Lord says, isn't a human being more valuable than an animal? Instead of convicting them, my friends, you cannot have conviction in a heart that is hardened. And that's exactly where these people were at. And it just built up to the point where they're now going out to plot to kill him. Well, I want to center on a couple of things here tonight about the Pharisees. Because people, I think everybody here are quick to say, you know, yeah, get them. We're not Pharisees. But you know what? The whole spirit of legalism is rampant today in the church. The spirit of, ra of legalism even exists amongst us. Even within some of us who say, you can almost catch yourself falling prey to it. Let me share some things with you and see if this might um, hit home. A person who is a Pharisee today is one where obedience is the means to salvation and becoming righteous. Everything is work, 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 it's grim duty. Number two, I like this. A Pharisee or a legalist today is one that realize, they fail to realize that one must be saved from his nature, not just from his deeds. I'll say it again. A legalist is one who fails to realize that you need to be saved from your nature, your old man, and not from your deeds. That's a key thing that's different. Number two, three, absence of forgiveness for others. If you're like the elder brother who felt he was a goody two-shoes all along, and he felt he was obedient to the very end, and yet he was in bondage and lived like a slave. And it, was, and it came forth when he could not rejoice with his dad over his other brother who had come home after riotous living and squandering the father's inheritance. Let me tell you something. If you have a hard time forgiving people, chances are you have a spirit of legalism. Outward obedience and inward bitterness. If you keep on trying hard, trying so hard to do it right this time, I'm not going to fall off the wagon this time. I'm not going to do this. And you are so bitter and angry because you keep on messing up. You keep on messing up. You got yourself caught in the trap of legalism. That's what the Pharisees were all about. People who are caught in legalism are also filled with pride. Wow. They compare themselves with others and boast of accomplishments. I am more spiritual than that person. Well, at least I didn't do this, or I didn't do that, or look what I did. A spirit of comparison, a spirit of pride, means that you are competing for performance. And remember, it's the heart change, not the deed change. Number six. If you continually find yourself saying, well, that's not fair, chances are you have seeds of legalism in your life. If you hear something happen where this person was given this consequence and you got this consequence and you say, that's not fair, that is one who doesn't understand the love of God and how God's love flows forth and maybe makes a different decision through a leader than what you got. Number seven. A person who's caught in legalism often complains the loudest of the sins of others. Boy! And you know the sins that they complain the most about are the ones they want to be doing themselves. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Number eight. A person who's a Pharisee also sees life events Life's events in terms of reward. In other words, if I'm obedient, then I'll be rewarded. I'm going to do this right because I'm going to be rewarded. I'm going to do this right and I'm going to be rewarded. That's a sign of somebody who is caught in a performance trap, which is a sure sign of legalism. 
And number, this is a good one. People who are legalistic, listen carefully, they detest those who are walking in the freedom of God's grace. A legalist cannot stand a person who's free in God's grace. They will fight them, they will argue them, they will point out their flaws, just like the Pharisees did. They couldn't stand Jesus. Number 10. I'm going to quote this. Only those who have been grasped by grace will be able to rejoice in the super, super abundance of God's grace lavished upon those who are so clearly undeserving. I'm going to say it again. Only those who have been grasped by grace will be able to rejoice in the superabundance of God's grace lavished upon those who are so clearly undeserving. How many times have you had somebody come back here and in your pharisaical mind will say, yeah, he's back again. Yeah, he's back again. Instead of praising God for the grace of God that brought him back. Now there's a contrast here because if you look up in chapter 11, if you just focus your eyes up and catch chapter 11, you see Jesus in chapter 11, verse 28. He says, come to me. Who is he calling? All you who labor and are heavy laden. You know who he's talking about? All the people that have been shackled by the legalism of these Pharisees. They're shackled. You've got to do this, you've got to do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. I didn't measure up, I did it again. Oh man, I'm a failure. Why is everybody happy? I can't praise God. I mean, I, this, is, this is what was making these people so bound. They were in chains of the legalism that the Pharisees and the organized church were running. But Jesus says, what? You come unto me, all you who are weary, labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. Well, yoke means it's not a piece of cake. Because a yoke is like a contraption that goes over one neck and then goes over the other neck of an animal. When you have to work, but you're working with you're working with your fellow person you're yoked to. And that's Jesus. So he says, he says, you yoke up with me, and you're going to learn from me. Why? Is it going to be Wonderful because Jesus is gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, that's the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. I just spent four days with very religious women that do not have the joy of knowing what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They take their grace for granted because they were baptized as children. And they'll talk about not being as not being as bad as this one or that one. And they have their little hierarchy knowing that they're doing the best they can and their kids are good and everything's fine. And you know, they don't understand what it's all about. Well, the yoke of Jesus was demanding, but it's easy because of what he offers to us. We're justified by grace, not by obedience of the law. Paul was hit so hard and he stressed that so much. But before I close, I do want to say this. When we are saved from our nature and not from our, from our deeds, that means we have Christ Jesus within us. Jesus says, and Pastor often quotes it, I don't do anything of myself. The reason why he said that doesn't mean he didn't have the ability and the power to, no, because he was yoked to the Father. And whatever the Father did, Jesus did. Because he wanted to fulfill the purpose that the Father had for him on this earth. Likewise, we're yoked to Jesus. Why? For him to browbeat us? No. For him to guide and direct and carry us along so we can accomplish the purpose for which we're here. But then it's like driving down the middle of the road. As we're going down the middle of the road, we can fall into this legalism and, and this performance trap and get bitter and judge others and all this. But then we can overcorrect and find ourselves on the other side of the road in the ditch. And that's just the opposite. 
I'll give you an example. In my younger years, when I was feeling a little frisky after my husband divorced me, and I just decided, boy, this is it. Nixon had pulled the water gate, and all hell was breaking loose. People were, were, were putting down my black brothers and sisters, and there was a war going on in Vietnam, which I didn't understand, and I was a part of this. All of this together got me to the point where I just said, well, talk to my head, I'm leaving. I dropped out. And I had this idea that, you know, I'm the captain of my sheep, ship and the master of my fate. And I had a sense of freedom. I can do what I want. I'm not going to kowtow to what they tell me to do. I can do what I want to do because I self-willed it. And I had a spirit about me. In fact, when I went back to Boston uh, about five or six years ago and went to Walden Pond and, and, and was there, and man, I'm telling you what, that same spirit started rising up. I almost said, later, Walt, guess what? I'm going to hit the road again. No, 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 no. You guys know that feeling. You know, you just feel free and you're just going to do whatever you want because your, your spirit. There are people in the body of Christ. There are people in the body of Christ. Listen carefully. There are people in the body of Christ that have that same spirit in regards to God's grace. Oh, God, I'm saved. All my sins are forgiven. I don't have to ask for any more forgiveness because all my sins are forgiven, and therefore I'm free to do whatever I want to do because God's grace are going to cover me. You see, that's the opposite extreme. You've got the legalism of the Pharisees, and you've got the... Do whatever I want to do because I'm free in Jesus. Well, let me tell you something. The truth of the matter is, if you're yoked to Jesus and the Holy Spirit is inside of you and he guides and directs you, it's his love and his forgiveness that's marked, it sets your feet going where you're going to go. It's his love that's going to be the motivation for what you say and what you do. And yes, the Ten Commandments still apply. Only now as a Christian, you are going to obey them. Why? Because you no longer live, but Christ lives within you. And Christ would have you to honor God, not have any idols, don't take his name in vain, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You know, the family, the sex sin, steal. Jesus said what? You, you, you have hatred in your heart and you're a murderer. All of that changes because... Christ inside of you takes over. The Holy Spirit takes over and you bear the fruit of the Spirit. And let me tell you something. The Lord loves to hear you say, I'm sorry, Lord. I failed to do this or I failed to do that. Please forgive me. It's not that I don't think that he hasn't already forgiven, but I'm appropriating the forgiveness he has given me and I'm keeping that close relationship with him. Because the minute we start singing and dancing in our freedom and just take him for granted, we're missing what it means to walk in the Spirit and not grieve the Spirit. So tonight I hope I gave you a little, little idea of what it means to be a Pharisee. We don't want that. But the same token, we don't want to have a cavalier attitude about our holy God who said, you be holy as I am holy. And that was also addressed to us in the book of Peter also. Amen? Amen. Father God, we love you so much, God. We thank you, Jesus, that you came in to give us life. And Lord, as we read the word and we see your heart, this is the heart that's in us that are born again. Lord, there are people sitting here who are trying to be Christians. Instead of being a Christian and then allowing Christ to live his life through them. I pray in the name of Jesus that their eyes will be open, that they will be set free, that they will be able to yoke up with you, Jesus, because you and you alone give us rest. In Jesus' name, amen.